First of all, th thanks to Rene and uh, ACF for the uh, invite to come and speak here this morning. Um, first point of order is I no longer work for Cancer Research UK. I work for the Francis Crick Institute, which I'm almost morally and legally obliged to talk about at, uh, at meetings like this. This is um, a brand new building that's being built in the centre of London, almost complete. This is the, uh, the artist's impression of it. Um, but we're formed by a merger of the London Research Institute, which is where I physically still work, and I think called the National Institute of Medical Research in, in North London. And we'll be starting moving into that building towards the end of the year, I hope. But I'm, I'm a cytometrist, you know, I, I'm amongst friends here. I can stand up and say I am a cytometrist. And I run a large and a busy core facility. And those of us who work or run core facilities know the sort of thing that we do. And we have to, we have to train users. It's a dirty job, but somebody's got to do it. We also have a lot of education. And even in a, an established core facility, you have, to, you have to move forward. You have to look for new techniques and technologies. So in the past few years, one of the ways that my job has changed is we spend a lot more time sitting down with users or even experienced users designing and troubleshooting experiments. Some of those experiments are very big. Some of them are simpler. And part of that is evaluating new technology as it comes along. So this is where the Novasite appealed to me as a core facility manager. Let's get that in. Let's put it through its paces. Let's see what it can do. And I'm not going to talk too much about the machine. You, you can go and see that on, on the booth. I'm not a product manager for ACR, but as you're probably aware, it's a 13-color instrument, six colors from a violet laser, five from a blue, and two from a red laser. And it uses a slightly different PMT arrangement, what we're used to in many of our flow cytometers, where each PMT is used for each laser. So we have three signals coming into each PMT, which has some advantages, certainly in terms of space and compactness. And I took the lid off, obviously, first thing you do when you get a new machine. And it's all, it's all pretty small in there. The other advantage, as Rene touched upon, is it's, it's volumetric. Now, there are other volumetric machines out there, but if you're in the business of absolute counts, Knowing how many cells you've got per microliter is, is very important to you. So, of course, there are a number of things that we need to look at when we're assessing new technology, new cytometers. For the, for the geeky part, obviously, we need to know how many lasers are in there, which lasers are there, what, what's the wavelength, what's the power of those lasers, which filters have I got, you know, which fluorochromes can I um, excite and I can use. We also have to think about how easy is it for us to train new users and intuitive software is something that's very appealing. We, we train everybody to run their own experiments, but of course part of that is actually running through software with them. So the easier that is, the less time I spend and the quicker users get up and running. But as a manager of a facility, there are other things that we have to consider as well. The physical size of the machine, is it going to fit very easily onto a bench? And it's, a, it's a very small, compact machine. How much is it actually going to cost me, not just to buy it, but to actually run it? You know, maintenance contracts, on costs, the fluids, the etc. that we're using. And also, can it be upgraded? Now, we generally buy machines to cover our needs as they are now, or as they will be for the next year or so. But can we have that same machine and upgrade that by adding, adding things at a later date? And of course, it's all about performance. How do we check whether this cytometer is performing as well as my gold standards in the lab? So some of that is, is sensitivity. Is it managing to pick up that low-level fluorescence or the small particles that we're interested in? Because it's volumetric, how well does it perform in absolute counting? And of course, how, how stable and how quick is it? So, you know, we, we're cytometrists. We deal with beads a lot, don't we? So we can show using multi-peak beads, six-peak beads in this case, that the sensitivity in all the channels is, is what we'd expect it to be. And you're going to hear a lot about beads, I think, in these few talks. But it's 13 colours. You can perform relatively complex phenotypic experiments on the Novasite. So this is just a comparison of exactly the same sample run on the Novasite, and in this case, one of the LSR2s in the lab. And you can see the pattern and the uh, ex expression levels of those markers is perfectly comparable. And, of course, as well as getting pictures, what we love about flow cytometry is we get the numbers as well. We do the statistics on this and we're seeing you know, exactly the same data on both of those platforms. My background is really in DNA analysis, so it's one of the first ports of call when I get a new machine. I stain up some cells and run them with propidium iodide. And again, comparing a Fortessa, which is what I would normally be running my DNA on, we're getting very, very similar results with an oversight. Great. 
This is exactly what we want. And in fact, you know, those, again, this is the same sample run on those two machines, perfectly. Uh, so in fact, the CV of uh, the Nova site is actually slightly better in, in this case, but we've not really found any difference. It's perfectly um, fit for purpose there. And of course, st checking the stability of your run over time in something that we should always be doing. You know, time is a free parameter for us on our flow cytometers. So again, that's this PI sample just showing that the stability of the machine over the course of running that sample is very good. But one thing we really want to try is most of the cytometers that I have in my lab are not volumetric. Okay? They are, um, they're not volumetric. <laughs> they just run your sample. And of course, having a volumetric machine in some circumstances is very important. So we didn't do a lot of clinical work, but we have got involved with it, some groups that are looking at circulating tumour cells or, or rare events like that, and they want to know the absolute numbers of those. And we know that there are lots of different ways that we can count cells. You know, we can use a hemocytometer if we're bored, because it takes time. There's a lot of variability in the counts. Or we can use one of the, the wide variety of automated cell counters that are out there that use either tripen blue or, or a um, plurimetric way of doing it. Or, of course, we can use a cytometer. Okay. That's what I want to be able to do. And to do it by cytometry, using a traditional flow cytometer, we would normally rely on adding counting beads to that. So if we have a volumetric machine, we should circumvent the need for that. But, of course, we have to show that. We have to show that the counting is accurate. So the first thing we did with the machine, we got some counting beads. We used the Life Technologies beads that come at a, a known concentration. Oh, some more lunch if you didn't get any. And run those through two different machines. So I said most of the cytometers I have in my lab are not volumetric. I do have a, a rival one, a MaxQuant Vibe in the laboratory. So we have the perfect machine to, to compare, compare with. We can do that in-house. And Counting beads are actually a bit notorious to handle. Um, we, we made sure that we, we had our, my colleague Sook there is in the audience here and I, we're doing all these experiments, we made sure nobody else touched that bottle of beads because handling of counting beads is quite important. You know, making sure you, you vortex each time and handle them in the same way. Otherwise your count is different every time and that's a bad thing. So we had these life technology beads and at this point they were at 96 beads per microliter and all we were doing here was running beads through the cytometer. And coming up with uh, an absolute count, which in both cases is very good. Not just the absolute count, but the variability of the measurements. Remember, we're always going to get some variability in any measuring system, and we want to keep that to a minimum. There's all sorts of errors associated with our experiments. Most of that is before it even gets to the cytometer, the experimental variation or the, the user variation. So the lower we can keep the variability in the machine, the better, of course. And both of these machines perform very well over multiple replicates. And again, this is a slide I quite often show to users when you think, you know, how many events do I need to acquire to make sure that the, my measurement I'm confident is representative of the, the sample and therefore the, the population at large. And, you know, we, we, we know this, we all know this, and we, we need to acquire probably at least 500, ideally 1,000 of the events that we're interested in to make sure that our variability, our CV of our repeated measurements is acceptable. The lower we go, we have to accept that there's more variability. So it's not just about the volume that we count is also about the, the number of cells that we count. I was a bit worried that I was going to put lots and lots of Excel spreadsheets in here which would bore everybody to tears, so we tried to distill what were quite a lot of experiments into, into something simple. And that's not actually very simple, is it? But it, what it does is it shows that both, both our volumetric machines, the, the Novosite and the Vibe, have two different um, pressures, three, sorry, three different pressures that we could use, you know, cunningly called low, medium and high which obviously applies more pressure to the syringe, so things run through more quickly. And because it's volumetric, we can tell the, the cytometry software how many microliters we, we want to take up. So again, we just looked at a, a variety of those, different um, volumetric uptakes, different speeds, and again showed that the variability in the counting isn't bad. And again, the CV, the reproducibility of all of those is, is very good. We might expect it to be slightly lower in the sort of lower volumes because we're not counting as many cells, but it was actually very good indeed. Just so that I can show some more flow cytometry data, these are, these are beads and cells. It doesn't get much more complex than that. So once we were assured ourselves that the, uh, the volumetric counting was, was fine, obviously then we can go away and use that to actually do some proper 
viability counting experiments. And initially, we had the beads in there as well, so we had that belt and braces. We could assure ourselves that the, uh, the volumetric counting was working with an internal standard, and then um, assess our viability, simply in this case by um, propidium iodide uptake. And again, over multiple platforms, so this time as well as using another, the other volumetric machine, the Vibe, we also use the Fortessa by adding the, the beads. And again, I'd expect slightly more variability when we're looking at, at cells because you know, beads are beads and they're nice and round and uniform. But we still get respectable variability. You know, 10% I'd, I'd be quite happy with. It's much less than the variability we're introducing in the, um, ex the actual experimental running ourselves. So then we were, quite, we were quite happy that the machine was counting the cells as it, as it should be. So perform a very, very simple experiment, simply looking at a growth curve. We're using those, those three machines, mm -hmm. seeding our cells, jerkat cells in this case, at about half a million per mil and just following them over the course of the week. So on both the volumetric machines we take up 50 microliters and on the Fortessa we made sure we acquired 5,000 beads. And again, as we'd expect or as we'd hope, we see very little difference between those, those three machines over the course of the experiment. So we're perfectly happy, we've convinced ourselves that it's doing what it says on the tin. Okay, we are getting the right um, volume taken up there, it allows us to use that for absolute counting. So that's all really I want to say, it's very simple. We checked the sensitivity of the oversight, very good, as good as uh, the other machines we have in the lab. It's very good for DNA, the linearity, the CVs that we're getting on our DNA peaks, very good. Multicolor phenotyping, you know, three lasers, 13 colors, covers probably 90% you know, of what people are going to want to do, certainly in, in my lab. And it's a very good absolute counting machine. One of the problems with moving to a new laboratory and actually getting more staff as we've merged to is we don't yet have a, a team photograph. So I had to use one of the older ones <laughs> to put up here. We've aged well. Okay. So, and this, some of this information will eventually make it to our new website, which is there. So thank you. That's all I want to say. So, um, hi. Hello everyone, uh, it's lovely to, uh, to be in, uh, in Glasgow. Uh, it's particularly lovely because I've just moved to Newcastle, which meant I could get here in three hours, which is a real treat. Um, so the title of my talk is uh, Evaluating a CNOVA Site Benchtop Flow Cytometer System for Identifying and Enumerating CD34 Positive Cells in Human Blood. So there's a little bit of a disclaimer right at the front, you know, this is not a clinical um, project. Um, it has some, obviously, clinical relevance, which we'll talk about in a minute, but again, as a disclaimer, and because I'm being filmed, um, I have to say that. But um, effectively, um, just as by way of a little introduction of where I'm coming uh, from today, uh, as I said, I've be, um, since February this year, um, I've moved to Newcastle University. I've, I've left Derek's lab, which um, I don't know, I think he's quite happy about that, actually, but I don't know, maybe not, maybe not. Yeah, look at the smile. Um, but I've moved up to Newcastle University, and um, one of the things that really attracted me about the job um, was the fact that um, it's got a very kind of dynamic and very kind of um, mixed um, user base. So... I have two facility sites. I have one here at the uh, International uh, Centre for Life um, down by the station, uh, and then we have another one at the medical school. Make, this floater makes it a little bit sinister, but it, it, it's you know it's quite a nice building. But the idea is that you know we're fulfilling the cytometry needs of about 200 registered users across many different disciplines and institutes. Now. Again, you know, I'm a bit of a fraud maybe because I'm not, my background is not um, clinical flow cytometry, even though this isn't a clinical talk, of course. Uh, I come from a research background. But um, one of the things that I thought about thinking about when uh, we were offered the chance of evaluating the Novasite system was, again, um, looking at a particular uh, application where absolute counting um, is particularly um, important. So just a little introduction uh, to the presentation. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about introducing CD34 positive stem cells and their therapeutic potential, just to put some context. I'm going to then talk about the significance of flow cytometry in the enumeration and identification of these cells. Um, and of course, the aims and parameters of this very, very small, simple pilot study and why we considered using the Novasite system. And then of course, what are the assessment criteria for the system? Um, really quite simple, I guess, is the ability to actually resolve CD34 positive cells from negative population. And of course, as Derek uh, introduced very nicely in the previous talk, the idea of using the volumetric count uh, capabilities to potentially replace the bead-based. And of course, we'll finish with some summaries and conclusions. 
All right, so um, we all know that stem cells are great, or have at least the potential to be great. Um, there are a few things which uh, jump out for me on here and how they could be used. Uh, I don't want to offend anyone in the audience because I'm going to offend myself, but I guess this is one which I'm quite looking forward to when this gets uh, released because I can get my lovely long hair again that I used to have. Um, but as you can see from this diagram, um, it's quite incredible the ability to potentially get these cells with you know um, all these regenerative potential and put them into particular sites in the body and you know maybe like you know, live forever. I don't think anyone really wants to live forever, but um, you know the idea of looking young when you're old is uh, quite attractive to some people. Um, so CD34 is a quite a, <laughs> quite a common marker, an important marker for for identifying cells with a stem stemless potential. Um, so CD34 is a single pass transmembrane receptor, it's heavily glycosylated, and if we go into the literature and have a little look and see um, what its expression kind of correlates with, you can see that there's quite a lot of different cell types uh, or progenitor types which uh, express or are thought to express CD34. So it's very common in the hematopoietic stem, um, stem cell, um, so you've got the ability to regenerate your immune system, things like this, also in MSCs got muscle cells, uh, keratinocytes, and interstitial cells. So really, it's, uh, it's quite a, thought to be quite a ubiquitous marker. So again, you know, if we think about the, some of the clinical significance of CD34 for positive cells, um, you know, it has the ability, as I said, to reconstitute the immune system and potentially in, in, in treatment of uh, blood, blood-borne cancers. Um, it's also being used quite a lot now to look at um, improving the recovery of people who've had heart attacks with myocardial infarctions and things like this, but also some work in, in, in the eyes and also in, in the muscle system. And I'm probably not even uh, scraping the surface on that. But how do we obtain these cells? So for those of you that, that do this kind of thing or are involved in it, and again, it was new to me before I, before I started this role, um, Obviously, these cells tend to exist in, in different niches, so in the bone marrow. So one of the ways in which you can get them is you can inject patients with mobilizing agents such as GCSF, get these uh, CD34 positive cells to move out of the bone marrow into the circulation. You can then put them on, uh, put the patient onto a machine, uh, perform this apheresis, collect them, and, and undergo preparation. And, um, and then the idea, of course, is that, you know, potentially, again, my disclaimer, you know, not a clinical project I'm working on, but um, you can potentially then take these cells and inject them back into some of, the um, some of the organs or the sites that I just showed in the previous slide. So where does flow cytometry come to this? Well, again, I'm sure many of you in this room are very, you know, um, au fait with this technique, but of course, flow cytometry is very important in understanding um, exactly how... Um, how many CD34 positive cells we've got during the apheresis process, but also um, identifying them. So we know that um, the accurate and precise enumeration of these cells is essential if you are doing it in a clinical setting. Um, you often want to know exactly how many of these cells you have, how pure they are, and then that has an inference for how many you would like to inject, inject, inject into a patient. Um, in terms of identifying them, um, the CD34 I showed in that diagram is heavily modified, so it's important to pick the correct antibody uh, class um, to make sure that you identify all different forms of CD34. So the, clip, the typical clone that's used is, this, I think it's HG12, which is classed as a class 3 um, epitope. Um, and then for those of you as well that are into your clinical cytometry, you'll be familiar with the Ice Age guidelines for gating. Now, when I first heard about this, I think I pronounced it completely wrong. And because it's Again, this is being recorded, and I'm not a Nobel Prize winner. I'm not going to tell you how I pronounced it. But if you watch Austin Powers films, then you'll probably understand how I got that wrong. Um, but anyway. But the thing is that you can obtain enumeration data on a, using flow cytometry using either the classic the dual platform method, where you have a hematology analyzed to give you a white blood cell count, and then you use your, um, you know, your percentage information from a flow cytometry experiment and cal use that calculation. But more recently, the single platform method has become very popular. So you're using flow cytometry analysis in combination with these counting beads that Derek introduced earlier um, to perform your absolute counting. But again, of course, you know, what about the volumetric approach? It's very attractive. We've heard in Derek's talk previously that, you know, there's no need for counting beads. And I hope there's no manufacturers of counting beads in the room, but, you know, they are quite expensive. And there are some strange issues, again, as Derek talked upon. You can tell I used to work with Derek. Um, that there are some potential issues with inaccuracies on counting beads. There was a paper, I think, in 2001, which describes the disappearing phenomenon or something of these counting beads. Now... This is really why I thought it would be interesting to evaluate the Nova site. So again, we've heard a bit about this, well, quite a bit about the system uh, and you know what makes it attractive then for me looking at this um, for, for the enumeration of CD34 positive cells. 
as we've heard from Renee and Derek, you know, it is quite easy to set up with some built-in standardization. We've got fixed voltage uh, wide range PMTs, so up to 24 bit with a 7.2 log decade. So again, for, you know, sort of, I don't want to use idiot proof as a word, but, but just for ease of use, it's quite nice not to have to go in and set up PMTs or rely on other ways of setting uh, photomultipliers automatically. Uh, it has automated QC. Derek showed a screenshot of this using kind of six peak multi level beads, which is um, you know, it's quite familiar to me. I feel quite comfortable with that. It gives you an idea of kind of sensitivity, but also linearity as well. Uh, it has an automated compensation wizard, which again is pretty good. We've tested that a few times and it seems to stand up and work quite well. And then, you know, just also having an auto sampler system for an unattended run is quite a, an attractive feature too. Uh, as we heard as well, you know, it's multi-laser and multi-detector, so the 3000 model can go up to 13 parameters with forward and side scatter. So we also have that added ability of being able to do a multi, you know, reasonably high, high, high number multi-parameter phenotyping as well. And then again, as I keep stressing, it's volumetric. So potentially we could eliminate the need for either having a look at white blood cell counts on the hematology analyzer with dual platform method or using any kind of counting bead. All right, so what's the assessment criteria of what we did? So um, yeah, I'm not going to use any other names here. I'm going to, it's a bit like the, I guess, the Pepsi taste challenge or something. I'm going to, I'm going to anonymize some of it. But um, we assessed three flow cytometer systems. Um, cytometer one, right, you can probably guess what it is. But uh, it's a small benchtop system. It's volumetric. It has fixed voltages. Uh, it's got about, I think, four PMT or four fluorescent parameters plus forward and side scatter. So yeah, probably should have just put a photo of it. But cytometer two is a mid-range system. Uh, it's non-volumetric, adjustable PMTs. And again, if I was to say to you, it's the machine which is pretty much always used, or one of the two machines which is pretty much always used for this assay, you'll probably again guess what it is. And then of course, we've got the Novasite 3000, as we've heard, small bench top system. It's volumetric, fixed voltages, and uh, 13 parameters. So the criteria for me uh, in trying to see if there's any possibility to do this assay at all on the Nova site was, well, uh, you know, if I'm going to enumerate CD34 positive cells, I would like to be able to uh, resolve them nicely from the background. So very, very simple and a metric that we're all familiar with. We can use a stain index to uh, put a number to the ability to resolve a, a positive signal from potentially background. And then we have a little bit, you know, as Derek's shown as well, looking at the accuracy and precision of CD34 enumeration by using counting beads. So we can obviously use counting beads on any of these systems that I've just introduced up here. Uh, for those of you that know uh, the CD34 uh, enumeration protocols, you, you can obtain uh, standard samples with, with known numbers of or percentages of CD34 positives. And you can either buy those commercially or you can obtain them from uh, some of the kind of regulatory bodies that exist for this assay in the UK. But it's good to know that because then you have sort of this idea of accuracy because you have a kind of a known number that you should be, uh, or a range that you should be within. So we also did the above, but moving away from the bees, but using the volumetric approach so on cytometer one and the Nova site, we're able to do that. And then again, as above, uh, we moved away from looking at these standard samples to look at kind of more challenging uh, samples. So apheresis samples, which are a bit more messy. And then particularly if any of you have ever worked with cells that have been cultured, so CD34 cells that have been put into culture or frozen down and thawed, you know, it starts to become a little bit more of a challenging um, uh, kind of system to work with. And again, for continuity, a little plug as well, actually, we ended up using the Nova Express software, which um, at first kind of look, I found it a little bit, I thought it was quite, quite basic, but it actually worked really, really well because I was able to take all the data from these three different systems, put it into that software, and it was able to kind of, you know, handle the scaling issues that I had from the open range PMTs, but also deal with the, uh, the scaling on the uh, more kind of conventional systems. So here's an example of the iSage gating strategy using Nova Express. Um, I think the ice age gating strategy is you know, it's a very elegant way of doing things, but um, again, if anyone's ever sort of come into it from from first view, uh, you know, it's quite challenging. There's a lot of boolean gating going on, and uh, I think actually might make quite a good drinking game actually, uh, which I might try at some point, and uh, maybe you can join me. Every time you get a boolean gate wrong, you have to take a shot of whiskey and try again. But effectively, so this is just an example of a of a known control that we ran on the um, on the Nova site in this case and analyzed in the Nova Express software. So just follow me here because it jumps around a little bit. Again, I'm sure many of you are more experienced, but here we've just got a little gate, um, a plot at the bottom showing the, uh, the counting beads versus side scatter. We, we identify counting beads so we can enumerate those. Uh, we then have another plot down here which kind of helps us get rid of some low level debris on the forward and side scatter. Build some Boolean logic between these two to make not gates and do an and not gate and jump up here and look at the CD45, identifying a lymphocytic gate, 
and just trying to sort of basically make sure this is obviously lies blood, uh, just making sure that we get all, all of the CD45 positives and ignore some of the other ones. And just obviously here to make a point, this is from experience, be careful on the threshold that you set because some of these cells, as we'll see, that we're looking at can fall quite low, so you don't want to miss them. So the next kind of bit you do is obviously very straightforward here. You take these guys and you identify the cells that are CD34 positive. Um, for those of you that know CD34 positive cells, they also have some other phenotype um, elements to them. They should be low or lower on CD45 and low on side scatter compared to lymphocytes. This is just the back gate here showing that we've got a few cells which fall, don't fall in that category and a few that do, obviously. And then sort of the final oh, couple of gates is also checking back gating these putative CD34 positive side scatter low 45 low cells onto a lymphocytic blast gate just to make sure that they are a little bit more blastic than, than, than other cells because there's other cell types like hematogones which can also uh, be CD34 positive but uh, have a slightly slower, lower blast. And then finally as well of course you've got some 7AAD in there so you can identify cells which are alive and dead. So this is the kind of work through and you know I have seen Ice Age done in other ways but this is, this is kind of you know a reasonable attempt at, at doing it. And of course it's consistent in a way across all the data sets. So first question is I said how well does each system resolve the CD34 positive events from the negatives? So we've got eight, uh, an oversight uh, versus cytometer 1 and cytometer 2. So just starting with cytometer one, uh, working from left to right, we've got the high control, the low control, the apheresis, and this more challenging cultured population. And effectively, you know, it's pretty good at resolving. We can see CD34 positive events over background. And, you know, in the cultured ones where they've kind of been expanded as well, you can see quite a nice big dominant population. The cytometer two, just putting in here, it's got optimized PMT voltages. Obviously, that has to be optimized using some kind of inbuilt QC, and that was done. Same picture here, really, similar kind of percentages, similar kind of patterns of staining. And then finally, as well, with an oversight, also pretty good. So taking those values and putting them into a stain index of CD34 PE signal, um, what we find, cytometer one, two, three, for this high control, so the high number of CD34 positive cells, a little bit variable overall, no, 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 no significant differences. Uh, low control, very much the same. If we come across the apheresis sample, again, not much different at all. But as you'd expect um, from a cultured sample, um, the resolution is not as good. But that's the same across all the different systems. So overall, first sort of stage, uh, you know, ability of the oversight compared to these other two cytometer systems was very good at actually identifying CD34 positive cells. So then the next and final simple question is then how does the volumetric counting of the CD34 positive cells compare with a bead-based system across the different cytometers? One of the nice things about the bead-based system obviously is it can be read on all the three cytometers so it becomes like a, like a cross-platform sort of normalization. And then of course we have one cytometer that can do the volumetric and one that can't and then the Nova site as well. So just starting off with these standards, these known standards, we started with the high control. So on the left-hand side, we've got uh, absolute counts measured by bead system. Again, we've got this upper and lower limit on this sample for uh, what the count should be um, per microliter. And we can see that, you know, for some reason, cytometer one didn't quite, didn't quite make it, just didn't quite make it over the threshold. Um, but cytometer two and the Nova site using the bead-based system, pretty comparable. Then if we look at exactly the same samples uh, using the volumetric approach, uh, again, cytometer 1, a little bit higher, just creeps over the acceptable uh, limit line. But reassuringly, the Nova site system is actually pretty good, and it's pretty comparable when we compare the bead and the um, volumetric. So that's pretty good. That's pretty good. And then if we look at the low control, where we've got a lower frequency and a lower number of CD34 positive cells in the sample, you can see it's a little bit noisier and a little bit messier. But um, again, all the systems really behave pretty much the same. There's a bit of variability, a bit more kind of, you know, variation in the measurement, but overall it's quite, it's quite consistent. So the kind of conclusion from this part is that similar results really from each system, um, bead versus volumetric, and um, for some reason cytometer one was just a little bit low on the high control. But okay, they're the standards. I mean, we also want to look at more challenging samples. As I said at the beginning, you know, a sample from an apheresis uh, stage can be a little bit more messy, and uh, also the cultured ones as well. So again, we can see pretty comparable not really much to say there. We don't know how many there should be, um, but at least in terms of kind of the precision of the measurements across the different systems, it looks okay. And then the culture system, again, no problem at all, seems to have handled that really, really well. So again, simple conclusion really is that the apheresis sample is quite consistent across the system, beads versus volumetric, um, but a little bit more variation in that culture sample because it's a bit more challenging actually to identify the positives over the background. So then just to summarize what, what I've shown you, um, you know, the ability to resolve the CD34 positive cells from negative was comparable across the three systems. All three cope very well with ch more challenging samples. These are the cultured ones. Um, and the comparison, the absolute counts derived by bead-based systems were pretty much similar. So um, 
An oversight for me actually may represent a, a viable option for uh, identifying and enumerating actually doing this assay by volumetric means. And I think the fixed wide range PMTs will help in, you know, if it ever does go down to some kind of clinical route, which I don't know, I can't say that for sure, whether it will or whether it won't. But the idea of having less things to standardize and less things to change, regulators kind of like that kind of thing. So, um, but we're not okay yet, so it's very much for interest only. Hi everyone, my name is Matt Haynes. I'm from the Scripps Research Institute. Um, Alan Saluk was supposed to come and speak, but he sent me instead. Um, I'm actually going to give two talks here. Uh, the first one is Advanced Volumetric Cytometry Analysis of Marine Phytoplankton. Uh, a little background about that. One of our workers is from the, the Scripps Institu Institute of, Institution of Oceanography. And with him, we've had some, some users that have required um, oceanography experiments. So we're going to start out with analyzing phytoplankton by flow cytometry. Um, it's routinely used to study phytoplankton, taking advantage of innate fluorescent uh, molecules. <clears throat> um, we had three sample collection sites. Uh, one of them was near shore at the Oceanography Pier in La Jolla. Um, we had oligotrophic um, samples in the Weddell Sea, and we had pond samples from the microalgae waste ray ponds. Um, there's three steps to it. Preservation, we had to collect the samples in sterile tubes, fix them with 0.5% uh, glutaraldehyde, incubate at 4 degrees for 20 minutes, flash freeze in liquid nitrogen and store it negative 80 degrees Celsius. Um, for the actual sample work, some of these samples were collected on, on ships and, and otherwise. Um, so they were able to be stored for a while and when it actually came time to analyze the samples, um, they were thawed in small batches at 20 degrees Celsius. Unstained samples are analyzed in immediately with no staining necessary for phytoplankton groups. Um, heterotrophic bacteria was stained using cyber green. And everyone else has already spoken about the novocyte. Um, but the things that really came in handy here were the um, volumetric sample delivery using the syringe pump. Um, the three laser system also helped as far as separating all the populations out. And the seven log dynamic range helped as far as not having to change voltages and the machine's ready to go right away. Um, these are the pigments that we were looking at. Uh, we're looking at chlorophyll, um, PE, APC, um, green, chlorophyll A, as well as light cyber. scatter. You can see which, you know, they're spread across the three lasers. Um, and the emissions are somewhat spread out. They're kind of grouped together in the, in the red area. Um, these are the photosynthetic groups that we actually found using this method. We weren't actually sure what all we were going to find. Um, I'm not too familiar with them myself, um, but these are the results that, that Brian was able to come up with. Um, for the Scripps uh, Oceanography Pier, um, we found eukaryotic groups as well, P positive, APC positive, um, and then bacteria and virus in the... Where's the laser on here? Um, so this is all with no staining, the, the plots on the left side. Um, on the right, we use cyber green to separate virus and bacteria. Um, we were able to, to threshold using uh, just forward scatter for the um, chlorophyll populations. Um, and then for cyber green or for virus and bacteria, we had to trigger off of fluorescence. Um, I believe he used 0.02 filtered seawater in order to set the threshold for these, um, but it wasn't too difficult. You can see it's all the way out of 10 to the 2 for the smallest uh, scatter populations. Um, for the Weddell Sea, these are populations that, that don't have much um, plant nutrient. <clears throat> um, so you can see a lot of the eukaryotes are gone in this case, um, as well as, oh no, this one we didn't do virus or bacteria. Um, the raceway pond is a pond, it's kind of a synthetic, not a synthetic system, but it's an artificial system that's kept at UCSD. Um, they grow virus and bacteria and everything else there. Um, <clears throat> you can see that this one is chock full of virus, and unfortunately, we were going to do some other comparisons, but the pond actually crashed uh, a few months later. Um, using all the fluorescence and everything, we were able to show using just the scatter populations where these populations uh, show up. Um, you can kind of see the the differences there. 
And basically, the syringe, like I said before, syringe-driven fluidics allowed for reliable counting. Multi-laser format helped separate the populations, and the fixed voltage allowed for repeatability. Um, one of the big things about it is uh, researchers could actually bring this cytometer onto a ship. It has a small footprint and is relatively stable. Um, you don't have a pressure-driven chief tank or anything like that. Any movement shouldn't really affect the, the signal too much, so it ends up working out pretty well for that. Um, one of the other talks I was going to give was talking about how the Novasite fit into a flow core facility. Um, we're kind of a large flow core. Um, this is our analyzing arsenal. Um, we have three facilities on our campus. Uh, most of the instruments are on the main facility. We have three LSR2s, a Canto, and one of the Novasites. About a quarter mile away, we have another Novasite and another LSR2. And then in another building much farther away, we have a Caliber. Um, you can see that the, the parameters are fairly comparable between the Novasite and the LSR2. Um, a lot of the users tend to do between 6 and 10 colors, but occasionally we have the 18 color user. Um, as far as training goes, we train everybody to run their own analysis. There's a few people that we run here and there that only have to run every once in a while. Um, but typically when it comes to training people on the other instruments, it tends to take a couple of one to two hour sessions. Um, at the Nova site, we actually found that we were able to train people within about a half hour. Um, the software itself is very intuitive, allowing people who have any flow experience to be able to jump on and use it, knowing what they're looking for. And those with no flow experience, if we introduce them to cytometry and, and what they're looking for, then, then we basically just have to tell them to tell the software where the samples are, and they can hit run and walk away and come back and see what they came up with. Um, he wanted to cover the phenotypes of typical core users. Um, they include day zero, novice, non-technical, uh, and different users, and bead counters. Um, the <clears throat> users with no experience, um, like I said, the setup is very simple. There's no voltage setup or anything, so they can't paint themselves into a corner. Um, the automated compensation certainly helps, especially that it happens real time as soon as the sample is collected. They can see the compensation happen right there and usually tell whether or not it's worked. Um, Training, rather than focusing on all the, the roadblocks in the software and stuff like that on some of the other cytometers, um, they really just have to queue up their samples and they can really focus on uh, what cytometry is and how they're using it and, and all the other rea realities related to that. Uh, the novice users are usually our users that acquire single color experiments or they collect multicolor data using templates only. A lot of times they don't set up or anything, they just have, um, they have a template that the lab set up for them and they just run their samples on that. Um, with this, with the auto compensation, since it draws the great gates and graphs and everything, there's no time spent there teaching them how to do that. And the software, we actually found the users that had any bit of experience, there was no retraining required. Half of them could usually just hop on and, and use the instrument right away. Um, for the indifferent user, I noticed a little bit of uh, bitterness here. They're the ones who usually don't clean up and don't change the fluids afterwards. And being a shared use facility, you can run into a lot of issues with uh, clogs and with dirty machines and stuff like that. Um, being that we're sorting all the time, it's hard to police people. And so when you switch from a user having to spend 10 to 15 minutes cleaning an instrument sitting in front of it to just one click, uh, we found that we haven't had any clogging issues with this, this instrument. And typically when the next user gets on, uh, the sample's really clean and, and it's able to run through. Um, the other benefits are the one-click shutdown. Um, it goes, it forces the instrument through a cleaning cycle at that point, so even if nobody does clean throughout the day, every day that it gets shut down, it goes through the cleaning cycle. And it actually comes in handy for the remote facilities because I can log in remotely and shut down through the software and not even have to run over there and, and shut it down. Um, for the cell counter, as, as they very thoroughly described, the syringe-driven sample injection allows for direct absolute counts. Um, and the software provides input for sample dilution. Um, we do have some users that they try and run the entire sample and use that as a count instead of uh, using beads or using anything like that. So it's easier to convince them to use this instrument for those sorts of things and to show them that you know there's more, more required than running an entire sample. Um, <clears throat> so we discovered working harder, not smarter is kind of the way to go. It's not always the best thing to fill your lab with the largest, most expensive instruments. Um, with less focus on the software and operation because of its simplicity, they can focus more on the experiment at hand. 
and build a strong foundation for the continued training. Um, the demo actually helped us out a lot. It's almost like an interview for the cytometer. Um, users actually were able to find pros and cons that we didn't anticipate. Um, one of the ones being that the, the users with any experience at all could jump on and that training was cut down by you know, a factor of five. So uh, thank you very much. I think that is it.